where do we begin? People are now just about arriving back to university, perhaps. We have people who are maybe even venturing into a new career post-COVID or mm. uh, looking to become increasingly competitive in the job market. They want to be able to consume, retain, deploy information and learning and comprehension and all this stuff. Where do we even begin? Yeah, that's a good question. I'd say probably the main principle that everything else hinges on is that learning is supposed to be effortful. It's supposed to be hard. Um, and it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of like the analogy I sometimes use for my students is it's like when you're going to the gym. If you're lifting weights that you can easily lift, you're not actually going to make any gains. It's just going to be a total waste of time. But it's when you start doing that progressive overload, when you start lifting weights that are, that are at the limit of what you're able to do, that gives your muscles the stimulus for growth. And then, you know, assuming you eat right and you sleep well, then you're going to get more hench and you're going to, you're going to be able to lift more weight. And it's sort of somewhat equivalent for learning that the harder it feels to learn something, the more likely that information is to stick. And this is very counterintuitive, right? Because still to this day, despite all of the decades of research that have been done about this that show that when learning is effortful, it's better. Despite all of that evidence, most teachers uh, still focus on trying to make the content as convenient as possible for their students. Like very well-meaning teachers who want to sort of categorize things into nice syllabuses and create a nice presentation and give them mnemonics and essentially take all of the difficulty out of studying for the student, essentially give them this packaged up thing that they just have to learn. But in doing so, the thing that they're packaging up that the student just has to learn, it actually makes it a lot harder for them to learn because the student then is not putting in any of the effort themselves. And so they have to, have to start finding weird ways to put effort into it. So that is probably principle number one that all of the rest of the kind of learning theory is based on. Don't expect it to be easy and almost lean into the discomfort a little bit that if you are finding something challenging to learn, that that's a signal that it it's doing the work. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's one of those things where like, I feel like there are very few domains in life where conventional wisdom is directly opposite to what actually works. But certainly when it comes to studying and learning, conventional wisdom is that we feel like we're stupid if, if what we have to learn is hard. If we're struggling through school or if we're struggling to understand a concept, we think, oh, I must be dumb. I must not be doing this right. But in fact, it's, it's the exact opposite. Like if you're finding something hard, it's a lot more likely to stick because your brain is having to work harder. You're operating at, your, at the limit of your, I don't know, your muscle's potential. And then that's the stimulus for growth. And then that's the stimulus for those connections to form so that it becomes slightly easier the next time around. What else do most people get wrong about learning? Uh, so a few things. There, there, there have been some really cool studies about this where, um, because uh, essentially college and university students are a great crop of people to do studies on because you can pay them like three pounds and they'll happily kind of sign up to do, <laughs> to do anything. So there's been this whole swath of studies about learning and studying and memorization done on college and university students. Um, the other things that really make a difference are, and this is probably, you know, apart from the fact that learning needs to be effortful, this is the single thing that makes the biggest difference in people's results for learning any, anything at all. And that is that we learn by testing ourselves. We don't learn by reading stuff. And this is, again, is, is, is counterintuitive because when you tell people that they, they should test themselves and stuff, they'll say, oh, well, I, I have to learn it first. And then I can revise it. And then I'll test myself for the exam. And there's a really good book called Make It Stick, which is all about the science of successful learning. And the authors basically say right up front in, in the introduction that, look, if you're a student or any kind of learner and you're not happy with the way your results are going, chances are you're just not testing yourself enough. There's evidence that shows that if you test yourself even before you start learning something, that's going to improve your learning. If you test yourself immediately after you learn something, that's going to improve your learning. If the only thing you do after reading something is just test yourself once, that is better than reading the same thing four times or writing a summary of it or creating a mind map on it. All you have to do is just test yourself. And again, this is so this is so counterintuitive. Um, we kind of think of in we, we we kind of think of studying and learning as if it's a process of putting information into our brains, but in fact. It is the opposite. It's the process of getting information out of our brains and in trying to retrieve stuff, that is what's forming the connections. Whereas when we're just reading things or rereading things or summarizing things with the book open, we're falling into that trap of thinking that familiarity is the same thing as understanding. 
Um, and you've probably seen this. I certainly get this a lot where I've read something enough times where I think, oh, yeah, obviously I know this. But then if you ask me, you know, can you actually explain it in your own words without looking at the book? I'd be like, oh, OK, uh, maybe not. And again, <laughs> there's just get the book. There, yeah. <laughs> and there is some evidence as well that the the emotional component of it is identical across across both of these domains. So, for example, if you were to read something that you've come across before and you read through it and you think, oh, yeah, I recognize this. It feels really good because you think, oh, yeah, I know this stuff. I know what's going on. It's exactly the same feeling as if you try and recall something completely from memory and you get it right and you think, oh, that's cool. And so because we're so used to rereading stuff and reviewing our notes and we have this topic of revising as if revising, like revision, like going over stuff again is going to help. It feels good. It feels productive. But as all the studies show and as everyone who's tried this in real life shows, rereading stuff doesn't actually help you learn it. Testing yourself on stuff does help you learn it. It's familiarity masquerading as comprehension. Exactly. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what it is. Great I, way of phrasing it. <laughs> I, had a, I had Peter C. Brown on the show. He was oh. like episode 19, two nice. and a half years Old ago. Uh, yeah. So anyone that's interested in this and wants to dig into Make It Stick, the book is really accessible, super good read. Um, and a nice primer for that is it's like back in the teens. Please, please ignore everything about my hosting ability and my sound quality. But Peter's, Peter's fantastic on it. Um, and from that, the one sentence summary of make it stick is memorization comes from repeated recall, not repeated exposure. Oh, that's a good phrase. I need to start stealing that. <laughs> that's fine, man. You can note it down at 145 <laughs> words per minute on your, on your mechanical keyboard. Whatever it is. It's going to make too much noise though on the recording. Yeah. That's what I worry about when I'm doing Have podcasts. you considered a silenced keyboard? Yeah, occasionally I switch to my Apple Magic keyboard, which is a little bit more quiet <laughs> if I'm doing like a live stream and I'm you. having to switch windows on the fly because oh, that's a bit, that's, it's a bit obnoxious. Yeah, it is. Um, okay, so we know that we need to lean into the discomfort. We also know that um, just continuing to read, I mean, everyone knows, everyone that's listening has been that person or knows that person who's like the flashcard addict who's mm. got everything laid out in a million color-coded, written and this, that, and the other, but doesn't ever actually end up doing the testing. And what you're saying is that we need to focus on the recall. We need to focus on the testing. Those are two nice principles to start us off. Where, where do we go next? Um, I'd say next, the third principle that I would talk about is one that's called spaced repetition. And this is, again, something that Peter Brown talks about in, in the book. The idea of spaced repetition is um, we've all had this experience where you learn something and then or, or, or you think you've understood a topic and you come back to it like a day or a week later and it's completely gone. Um, and again, when we when when this happens to us, if we're students, we often think, oh, I must be dumb. I must be thick because I'm not remembering this thing. And we'll look at the students around us and we'll say, oh, but Tom over there from Singapore, you know, he seems to memorize things as soon as he reads them. Uh, but what Tom from Singapore is actually doing is that He's not memorizing things the instant he reads them. There's no such thing as a photographic memory. Uh, what he's doing is that he's just revising. He's he's repeating the the topic more than once. And I don't know when. I don't know how this came into the sort of mainstream where people think that you should just be able to recall something after coming across it once. Uh, it would be completely ridiculous in any other domain of life. Like if you're learning a song on the piano, like obviously you have to practice it more than once to get it right. If you're trying to improve your tennis or squash swing. Obviously, you have to practice more than once. But we think, for some reason, at least everyone I knew at university felt this way, that, oh, if I don't, if I don't get it first time, I must be an idiot. And the idea of space rep repetition is that it combats the forgetting curve. So back in the 1800s, there was a, this dude called Ebbinghaus who did uh, a really weird experiment on himself, whereby he made himself memorize a bunch of completely nonsense words, like completely made up words, uh, not even the meaning, just to see how much he could brute force into his memory. And he plotted out how long it took him to forget each of these words as he memorized them. And he found that it was like one of those exponential decay, half-lifey uh, graphs, if anyone's familiar with those, whereby you lose the majority of it in the initial period and then the forgetting kind of slows down. So this is the forgetting curve. And the idea is that if we repeat the, the subject by testing ourselves on it and then by looking it up if we, if we got it wrong, that takes us back up to 100% memory. Uh, but crucially, the more we do that, the slower this curve decays. And so, for example, something like the capital of France is Paris. You've come across that fact enough times in your life through various means when you were younger that you're never really going to forget it. And 
that's because accidentally you've had this space repetition thing applied to it. Whereas if someone told you the capital of, I don't know, some random country is some random city right now, you would forget it unless you came across that fact again and again and again. And when you come across it enough times over a long period of time, it goes into your long term memory and then you'll ne- and then you're never going to forget it. So the idea behind space repetition is that initially when we learn something, we then want to repeat the testing of it fairly quickly, maybe a day or a few days later. And then once we've done that, we want to space it out a bit more. So maybe a week later and then maybe a month later and then maybe six months later. Uh, and so that's the spaced repetition aspect of it. And if we do that, we kind of get our forgetting curve to be quite shallow. And hopefully this stuff goes into a long term memory. Does that work for all types of learning? I can imagine your background as a med student. I know that we'll get into it soon, I'm sure, about Anki, which is one of the most popular space repetition softwares out there. Um, that's a lot of kind of rote, brute, very much brute force memorization. Yeah. What about if I'm trying to do something that's a little bit more fluffy, sort of philosophical concepts or um, uh, literature comprehension, stuff like that? In theory, this should work for everything. Um, at least, so in, in, in Make It Stake, again, referencing that book, they talk about a load of domains in which this, this sort of stuff applies. It isn't just for students trying to memorize biochemical pathways for medical school. It is sort of hockey players competing in tournaments. It's business people working in like in the corporate world. In all of these different aspects of life where people have done studies, you see this pattern of testing being super important and spacing also being super important. There's another book called uh, Range by David Epstein, where he talks about this basically in those exact terms. He says testing, spacing and interleaving are like the three sort of primary things for learning any skill, whether whether it's like knowledge for a university subject or whether it's like tennis or golf or anything like that. How generalists thrive in a specialized world. Also, exactly, yeah. a, also a past modern wisdom guest just after oh, that, that book came out. So, if you want to get on David Epstein, <laughs> Epstein, go back modern wisdom. I think he was around about maybe in the sort of late seventies, something like that. Um, so, this is this is what I've done every episode up until now. Ali has just been a prelude to this one, and this is the, this <laughs> is the yeah <laughs> fucking pinnacle right here. Um, so, we've got the testing, the recall. We've got the uh, fact that we need to lean into it. Um, and we've got the fact that we need to do spaced repetition. Are we on any more principles, or should we start to move into some uh, more stra- strategic stuff now? Yeah, so I suppose the the final principle is one that Epstein talks about, which is interleaving. Uh, and interleaving is the idea that um, we kind of want to be operating uh, in, in sort of our area, our, our zone of discomfort. So the example he gives in, uh, the, the example they give in Make It Stick, I think, is looking at hockey coaches and the way they found that this works best is you kind of train people and drill a particular exercise but just as your players are on the verge of getting it and really leaning into it at that point you switch completely and do a different exercise and as soon as they're on the verge of kind of getting the hang of that you switch completely and do another exercise and the idea behind this is that it's a bit annoying for the players because they're not experiencing that uh you know that mastery sensation that oh yeah i know what i'm doing i'm the don uh, but when you, when you have that feeling, you, you're not really learning anymore. Uh, and so the idea of interleaving is that you want to be doing lots of different things within a learning session or within a study session. Um, and so for example, the, again, this isn't how traditional schooling is designed. If you're having like a maths lesson, you would do, I don't know, uh, <laughs> trigonometry and Pythagoras theorem and sin cost tan, and you would do it in like a very specific order and when you're doing exercises you would kind of learn something and then you'll spend the rest of the lesson doing exercises about that thing that you learned where really the only thing that's changing is just the numbers and the concept is the same whereas what the studies show is that if you have a if you add a little bit more variety so you kind of make them do a little bit of something a little bit of something else a little bit of something else the brain is never quite allowed to be comfortable and therefore we're maximizing our learning uh, and minimizing the time we have to take to learn it how do you ensure that you reach a particular threshold and you don't always keep selling yourself short so that you don't get any comprehension with anything? Yeah, I think that's that's where the balancing act is because whatever you're studying, there is a level of uh, a level of time you have to put in to really engage with the material to kind of really get the hang of it, um, and that's that's the tricky part. The thing that I the thing that I do is that. As soon as I start feeling that feeling of, oh, okay, I'm quite enjoying this, 
at that point, I switch tasks. <laughs> so the interleaving yeah. and the discomfort, uh, the, the interleaving is the, it's the tool with which you force the discomfort into the learning process almost. Yes, if the learning process itself isn't, just it, it isn't uncomfortable enough where you're actually Already, yeah. the limit of your, of your thing anyway um so for example if i'm doing a completely new like a brand new topic and i'm really struggling to understand it i won't bother doing the interleaving because it's hard enough but as soon as i'm at the point where okay i i understand cardiology i understand how atrial fibrillation works uh, then i'm like okay let's let's add in some hematology to the mixture just just um, spice things up and make it a bit more interesting for my brain 